So I'm presenting on the necessity of audible algorithmic definitions for machine learning. Joint work with me, Hengu Ya, Ilya Shimilov, and Nicholas Papineau at the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute. Ooh. A quick outline of the talk. I'll first give a brief background on learning. What is it? Why do we care in a high-level taxonomy? Then we'll kind of move to the question of what it might mean to verify in learning. And really the question of, if given a model, what's the plausible data it could have trained on? And going from that, I'll present some impossibly results on verification. So yeah, without further ado, a quick background on unlearning. The main question you might be having right now is, what is unlearning, and why do I care? And it's essentially the observation that in many scenarios, I would like to have not trained on some of the data I trained on. I would like to forget that data. It could be for privacy reasons, as popularized by the right to be forgotten in the EU GDPR. It could be for security reasons. Maybe I trained on some data. I realized that some of it was poisoned. I'd now like to forget said data. And it could be for performance reasons, right? So maybe some of my data is detrimental, and I'd also like to forget that data. But really, the high-level scenario is that I've trained on some data containing a particular data point and obtained some set of models. But what I had, would have rather done is not train on that data point and obtain a different set of models. So what I want to do is some post-processing that we'll call unlearning. And hopefully, the output of unlearning, it resembles what I would have gotten if I didn't train on that data. But really, this high-level picture kind of skims an important detail, which is what is a model? How do we represent models? And we could think of them either as a particular weight or a distribution of weights if training is random, or a particular function or distribution of functions. And the thing to keep in mind is that weights are not functions. If you have the same weights, you have the same function, but having the same function doesn't mean you have the same weights. OK, with some agreed upon notion of what a model is, the question is, how should the output of unlearning relate to retraining? And so the first answer is that the output of unlearning should be exactly the same as retraining. But in practice, this is very expensive, and the only known methods are variations of retraining. So kind of trying to move away from the cost of retraining, we might ask, instead of exactly reducing the models, we do so with some error in some predefined metric. And I'd recommend one of my other papers for a more detailed discussion about different unlearning metrics. But OK, now with an idea of the main questions that we have when implementing unlearning, we can kind of ask what it might mean to verify unlearning. And in this paper, we specifically talk about exact unlearning, which, as I discussed, is essentially retraining. And the kind of question or kind of framework we have in mind is that we have a model, or really a proof associated to a model. And there's some verifier that could either, could either determine if we had trained on a, data, on a data point or had not trained on a data point. So really, we're kind of asking, could this verifier exist? And sort of the framework for verification that we'll think about is plausibility. We'd like to know if we could have plausibly trained on a data point. But how should we define plausibility? And if, you know, if all the operations were deterministic, a good if and only if condition is that you know, associated to each final model, WT, I actually have a sequence of checkpoints and a sequence of data points that would lead to this final model. And so I can check what data points I used. But in practice, you know, some operations are not deterministic. And so you would introduce some threshold. And this was proposed in past work and co was called a proof of learning. It was originally for model stealing, but we sort of repurposed it for plausibility. But OK, with this framework for verification, what would verifying unlearning look like? And essentially, an entity would submit a, a POL. And the verifier would first check the validity of the POL and then check what data points were used. And if a particular data point wasn't used, we'd say the entity had learned that data point. But if it was used, then you know, it fails on learning. But really, a key assumption in this like, plausibility model is that plausible without a point means never training on it. And that's something we can attack. So we have some problems. So kind of imagine I trained on a data set, and I obtained a valid POL. But before I submit it to a verifier, I apply a forging map, which really keeps all the checkpoints the same, but changes the data points to be those in a different data set. Now let's just assume that this data set is disjoint to the original data set. So if I was to submit this POL for any of the original points I trained on, the verifier would conclude I did not train on that data point. So clearly this is kind of spoofing uh, on learning. So OK, kind of the question is, well, when could forging exist? And some high level ideas you might have is that, well, maybe D and D prime are just have similar data points, which is that 
you know, for every data point in D, I have a data point in D prime that's similar enough that it produces similar gradients. Or you might think, well, what if D prime was just very big and it kind of produces any gradient I would ever want? So some sort of density argument. But what we kind of think about is a more probabilistic notion of foraging, which is maybe our training data has some underlying distribution and we can kind of prove something with this assumption, which is what we prove, is that if D is, not, is sampled from some underlying distribution and D prime is also sampled from that distribution, forging can exist. And this is under some mild assumptions. We'll assume that the update rule has well-defined mean and standard deviation, that the mini batch size we're using is unconstrained, so we'll prove it for some large mini batch, and that this, we're working over Rn and our distribution is absolutely continuous, so it's kind of nice in a sense. And the proof strategy is really to just increase this batch size so that our updates are approximating the mean from the underlying distribution, then using some concentration inequality, and then hopefully we can prove by non-zero probability. Obviously, this is kind of brushing aside, working with the framework and computing everything, but that's the high-level strategy. But the nice thing of this probabilistic notion is it kind of gives an intuitive way to instantiate forging. Because what we're saying is that some batch works. So if I kept checking batches, maybe I'll find that batch. And so kind of to illustrate this, in this paper, what we consider is we have a particular data point to unlearn, and we'll take as our forging data set some subset of D remove that point to unlearn. And what we'll do is when given an update to forge, you know, an update that used the data point to unlearn, we'll kind of search through some random batches of D prime, and hopefully one of them will be good enough. And this kind of approach is analogous to manipulating SGD with data ordering tax, where they also consider brute forcing through batches to do adversarial things, but different adversarial goals. So kind of an illustration of the results, in this figure we plotted 100 different trials, so 100 different points to unlearn. Each case, we took our D prime as some random subsample of D remove the point to unlearn. And then for a given step to forge, so a step that used the point to unlearn, uh, we searched through some random batches of D prime and picked the best one. And as you see, as we increase the batch size, the error gets small. So like, kind of as if it would keep getting smaller if we kept increasing the batch size. And we kind of, we used L2 squared for our error here. The paper has other figures describing other variables, and if you're in interested, I'd recommend looking at the evaluation section of the paper. But okay, what are really the conclusions, kind of the insights we've gained by thinking about plausibility for unlearning? The first thing is that being unlearned is not always a well-defined property of a model or a distribution of models. Which is to really say that if I was given a model or a distribution of models, it's not always clear without some kind of requirements of the setting what data points were used to train that model. And kind of you know, building on that, verifying retraining specifically requires algorithmic considerations. We have to be very specific about how training is done and the general setup, that we, the data setup that we can use. So okay, with the, the bulk of the paper discussed, what are some sort of open questions left by our work? Kind of as the second point previously was touching on, what are sort of the constraints we need to uh, impose on the training to kind of rule out forging? If you think about how I proved it, like how we proved it in this paper, there's some absurdities, right? Maybe the batch size is too big to be realistic. And so maybe imposing that can remove forging. Obviously, we just proved an impossibility result. We didn't say what you need to do to rule out forging, so that's kind of open. Um, another question is sort of building on this forging framework. Because what we've done is sort of related data sets in terms of what models they produce. And this is some sort of generalization, which is a, a key question in a lot of ML theory. And sort of the third point, which is maybe what a lot of people have on their mind right now, is sort of that privacy implications of forging. Because what we've sort of showed is that it's difficult to do membership inference in some settings. But membership, this is not the usual membership inference. We're not working with models. We're working with proofs of plausibility. But yeah, that's my talk.